Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Reformed Church's live stream service for April the 19th. A um, couple of announcements before we begin. Uh, the first of which is that uh, this afternoon, high school youth group will have their get-together via Zoom uh, at 3.30. And then at 4.45, there will be a, um, a church meeting via Zoom to talk about uh, plans going forward and the things that we um, are looking at attempting to do um, as we're in this circumstance for um, at least the next few weeks. So want to draw that to your attention. If you need the Zoom link, it was provided in email, or if you still need that, uh, reach out to me and I can ensure that you secure that. Um, the other thing that I thought would be good to do before we begin is I've heard a few people that said that they were going to wave at the beginning. So um, in order to make connection with that, just want to begin by saying hi and greeting and waving to you, and you in turn can wave back and not feel quite so awkward or strange about doing that. So greetings. As we uh, begin our service this morning, wanted to draw our attention to a particular theme. It's listed there at the top of the um, order of service, and it's this. Uh, the one great source of the Christian's joy is Christ. Let's reflect on that for a moment. God incarnate becoming man testifies of his love and compassion and inspires our hearts with the greatest joy by displaying how he who was rich for our sakes became poor. Through Jesus' life, suffering, and death, which paid the debt we owed to the justice of God and washed away the guilt and stain of our sin, we're given constant joy, knowing that we have eternal security through the Son of God. Our joy is confirmed by knowing that Jesus is now glorified, having risen victoriously from the dead, ascended into heaven and is seated in honor and power over the entire universe. And as he there intercedes on our behalf as our only mediator, may your joy continue to be strengthened knowing that Christ not only appears in the presence of God on your behalf, but also assures you, I am with you always, even to the end of the ages. As we reflect and celebrate this joy, let us uh, sing Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah, O My Soul, hymn number 57 in the Trinity Hymnal. We'll sing all four verses.
our Father in heaven, we come at this time to truly cry out with joy and thanksgiving to praise your name, knowing that uh, you are worthy of it. For you have been our God and have shown yourself to be an ever-present help in time of need. You have shown yourself to be a refuge and a strength. You proved yourself over and over again to be the consolation of your people, whereby you are uh, present at all times. You are working in the lives of your people. You sustain them through everything, and you have allowed us to come forward to this point to honor and adore and appraise your name. And although we are separated by distance, although we are not present in one room, yet you are the same God, and you have been more than capable to act on our behalf. We praise you and thank you for being good and faithful and for being the one who is always there. We pray that as we come together in order to lift uh, praises unto your name, in order to hear from your word and to make our requests and petitions known, that you would uh, be pleased to receive these things, make them pleasant in your sight, and that you in turn would encourage us and strengthen us with the truth of your word. And so encourage and help us now by the work of your spirit as we have standing in the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. As we note our joy in Christ, as he is the one great source of our joy, let us then uh, turn our hearts once again in song to sing of our Redeemer using uh, number 650, reflecting on all that he's done for us and consequently crying out to him with uh, joy and thanksgiving. Continue to make our way through the Belgian Confession of Faith. This morning we want to look at Article 15, which addresses the subject of original sin. And what we'll see in this is that as a consequence of, of our first parents' disobedience, uh, that being Adam and Eve, the extent of their actions affected not only them, but all those who come from them. Uh, through the ordinary means of generation. And we also then see just simply the extent, extent or the effect of it, that as it pertains to sin, it 
um, it is not only reflected in the fruit that is produced in our life, but we also see the impact on it uh, in terms of the root that is present in our life. So let's note these things um, as I read here from Article 15. Uh, The writers uh, noted, we believe that through the disobedience of Adam, original sin is extended to all mankind, which is a corruption of the whole nature and a hereditary disease, wherewith even infants in their mother's womb are infected and which produces in man all sorts of sin being in him as a root thereof and therefore is so vile and abominable in the sight of God that it is sufficient to condemn all mankind. Nor is it altogether abolished or wholly eradicated even by regeneration, since sin always issues forth from this woeful source as water from a fountain. Notwithstanding, it is not imputed to the children of God unto condemnation, but by his grace and mercy is forgiven them. Not that they should rest securely in sin, but that a sense of this corruption should make believers often to sigh, desiring to be delivered from this body of death. Wherefore, we reject the error of the Pelagians who assert that sin proceeds only from imitation. Even as we hear this uh, doctrine set before us, the Apostle Paul uh, is uh, keenly aware and in tune with this particular struggle in Romans chapter 7. He notes the turmoil that exists even within his own sanctified being, noting that which I would not do, I do, and that which I do not want to do, I do. And he notes then the struggle that is present and the concern and just simply the burden that rests on him as he identifies in verse 21, a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. This question of conclusion is, what do I do? He notes his wretchedness and he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he says this, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. This doctrine is of great importance and concern. But we always remember that the Bible does not leave us at the subject of sin but it always moves us forward to the subject of salvation found in the Lord Jesus Christ. That as he did um, descend, as he did dwell among us as the God-man who was perfect in the entirety of his being and not affected by the sin of Adam and Eve, having been conceived in the womb of the virgin by the Holy Spirit, we are assured that he truly is the one who can gain the victory and did so as he suffered and died in order to appease the wrath of God, as he covered over our sins by his blood, and he assures us of victory as he has risen from the dead. Let us give thanks and praise to God for the hope, the certainty, and the victory that we have through the Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, as we are assured of the promises of the gospel through the Lord Jesus Christ. So we pray that you would strengthen our hearts even now, knowing the struggles that are still readily present within us, knowing that although you have delivered us from the uh, position of sin through the Lord Jesus Christ, and knowing that you are now at work in us by the power of your Holy Spirit to free us from the practice of sin, we still see the struggle And the concern and the burden that we bear because of the the sinful nature we have inherited from Adam and Eve. We ask that you would assure us of the cleansing and of the pardon that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ. That we are uh, under no condemnation as we belong to him. And because of this position that we have, we ask that you would then strengthen us from within by your spirit to bear fruit to the honor and glory of your name. We thank you for the certain promise that you are at work in us, causing us to will and to do of your good pleasure. And that as you have begun this good work in us, you will continue it unto the, uh, the day of the Lord Jesus. And so we pray that you would effectively work in our lives, that we would love you more, that we would love Christ more, that we would love your, your word more, that we would love righteousness more, and that we in turn would hate 
those things that dishonor you and go against your holy will. We pray that you would increase in us a desire to seek you out in all things, to desire to know your will for our lives and to pursue that in all things. We pray for the love of holiness. We pray for the pursuit of it. We pray for the love of of all that pleases you and that we would see it implemented in not only the big things, but even in the little things, not only in the times in which we are present before others, but, but even when we are by ourselves and you only can see us, we pray that we would cling to that which is good and pleasing in your sight. We ask that you would do this work among not only us individually, but even us as a congregation that you would cause us to mature and to grow after the Lord Jesus, that you would build us up together as the, as the bride of the Lord Jesus, and that we would be spotless and pure and seeking your, your glory in all things. We pray that it would be manifest even as we are separate, having opportunity to pray for one another and having opportunity to encourage one another by by means of of words and notes and calls and texts cause us we pray to truly come alongside of each other to to spur one another on to consent to continue to look after the life and example of our lord jesus christ to pursue him even in isolation that in our pursuit of him, we might come forth as those who have been refined and tried and tested in exalting you in all things. We pray that you would truly be exalted in our lives. We especially pray for the glory of your name to be seen in, in the lives of those who are dealing with ongoing struggles. We pray for those who have health concerns that you would sustain them and encourage them through this time and by their living example of patience and a love for you that we would be edified and built up as we see your work being brought through them. If it be your will, please grant them healing and strength and comfort. Assure them of your presence and of your love. We pray for those who are especially dealing with uh, the, the coronavirus and are seeing the effects of that in their health. We pray that you would overcome that in them. And we pray that you would give strength and wisdom and encouragement to, to all who are involved in this particular situation. We think of government officials as they uh, continue to make decisions on behalf of the populace Grant them wisdom. Let's turn our attention now to the reading of God's word as it is found for us in Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, we'll begin with verse 1 and read to verse 11. Let's give our attention now to the reading and hearing of God's word this morning. Paul writes, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. In this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment, that you may approve the things that are 
excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. This morning we are beginning a series through the book of Philippians. This book is a, a rightful book for us to look at in light of our current circumstances. One of the basic themes of this book is joy. Or maybe it would be best for me to say a significant point made in this book by Paul is joy. Sometimes when we hear the subject of joy, we can confuse joy and happiness. We think of, of, of circumstances, we think of our situations, we find satisfaction and delight in them, and as a result, we have happiness. And we then say, oh, because I'm happy, I'm joyful. But Paul wasn't writing in circumstances that were necessarily those that brought satisfaction or delight, those that were planned or guaranteed, and yet he could still note this sense of joy. This idea of confusing joy and happiness is found throughout culture. It was just a few years ago, it's hard to believe it was probably about five or six years now, there was a song that came out by Farrell called Happy. And it made it up through the charts and everyone was just hearing it, dancing along to it and happy and so forth. And it was a catchy tune and in the chorus it noted this, because I'm happy... Clap along if you feel like a room without a roof. Because I'm happy, clap along if you feel like happiness is the truth. Because I'm happy, clap along if you know what happiness is to you. Because I'm happy, clap along if you feel like that's what you want to do. And I think as, as, as you hear that, and as it becomes so, so catchy and just moves us, we have this sense in which, well, as happiness occurs, as circumstances come along that, that bring up a sense of, of, of delight and, and just a sense of, of uh, satisfaction, we then begin to make that our position and our standing, and as Farrell's saying, it becomes the truth. It becomes what is for us. But the difficulty is that how do you maintain that truth? How do you maintain that perspective when you're stuck in isolation and you don't feel like you're too happy? When you don't have that room without a roof and you're therefore stuck inside, unable to go out. When you're hearing news about the possibility that you'll then be under some type of isolation and distancing for a few weeks. How does that bring about happiness? That's because the call for us is joy. It's the knowledge that, that we have a deep abiding confidence regardless of our circumstances. That although there can be situations of difficulty and pain and even disappointment, although we can see failures that, that come along in our lives and hurts and sorrows and, and all sorts of experiences that, that cause real discomfort, in hardship, we still can have joy. Because Paul is ultimately helping us to see that joy is established as our eternal well-being as a result of God's grace in salvation. And so this morning we want to see how we are joyfully connected in Christ because of that very point that we have our eternal well-being established by the grace of God in salvation. I noted that, that 
Paul, in writing this letter, he mentions the subject of joy or rejoice some 16 times in this epistle. It's only about 104, 105 verses long, and yet 16 times he mentions the subject of joy. And so he's helping us to see that 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 particular thought, that word, is important. It's significant. As he works through the idea of joy, he lays it out in, in, or with four basic thoughts in terms of the epistle. He notes that joy isn't because of circumstances. We'll see in a week or two how in verses 12 through 18 he was imprisoned and yet could rejoice. He even had the p- possibility of the sentence of death resting over his head and he could still note a sense of joy in fact in chapter 4 verse 11 he says i've learned to be content no matter what situation i'm in how because he had joy in knowing that his uh, eternal well-being had been established by god's grace in salvation he notes secondly that that joy is ultimately in God's gift of grace because he sets for us the grace that he's received in Christ he could rejoice though chained because his attention and focus was on Christ and that's what mattered as long as Christ was present as long as Christ was put forward as long as Christ was there he could say I have joy He even sees the the sense in which joy is found in the people of God. Although he's under house arrest and he is distant from the church in Philippi, he still could identify them in in chapter 4 verse 1 as his joy and crown. And how the church in chapter 2 completes his joy. And how his work among them was not in vain. And consequently they were bonded together in Christ and could have this joy together. Notice what he says in uh, chapter 2, verse 16 through 18, that as, as the word of God is being held fast, as the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I haven't run in vain or labored in vain. Because of my labor in you, I see that there is significance, there's worth, there's value, and therefore I rejoice. And he says, even if I'm being poured out and sacrificed on your behalf, I am glad and rejoice with you all. And then listen, for the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Joy is found in God's people. And so consequently, as we are brought together as those who are connected through Jesus Christ, even though we're separated and in our own houses and only able to meet through Zoom or through Facebook Live or through some other type of connection, As the people of God, we still can note a sense of joy because we can hear what the Lord is doing in each other's lives and take great satisfaction and comfort and hope in that and consequently rejoice in God. But even as we would note that joy is not present in circumstances and see the gift of God's grace and see the people of God being used by him for his honor and glory, ultimately, we see that primary joy is found in Christ. In chapter 3, Paul really allows us to see uh, just this sense in which he has all sorts of accomplishments and accolades and all sorts of prizes and awards and, and things that make him stand out above and beyond any other individual and yet he says even though i have all these things i don't take confidence or hope in my life instead i see that my strength and my hope is found in the glory of the lord jesus christ and so no matter how he uses me no matter what he does in my life no matter the pain or the turmoil no matter the circumstances or the difficulties As long as I'm connected to him, as long as I know him more, as long as I see denial of self and the increase of him and the knowledge of him and the certain hope and security that I have in him, nothing else matters. 
And so Paul skillfully, artfully, and graciously sets before us just an amazing point when he identifies that those who have Christ have joy. And as we see that unfolded through this book, that reminder set before us helps us then to take difficulties and hurts and changes in our schedule and challenges to our lives and say, because Christ is present, I still can have joy. He lays this out for us in the first part of his letter, verses 1 through 11, by noting three things in terms of how we are joyfully connected in Christ. He talks about, firstly, the common connections that we have. He then notes that they are truly joyful connections in verses 3 through verse 8. And then he notes how those connections are strengthened in verses 9 through 11. Listen to the common connections that he notes. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Three words I want to focus on, even though we could focus on a lot. <laughs> The first word is servant. Paul starts out, remember who he is, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, one used mightily by God in the advancement of the kingdom early on. He was a tremendous theologian. He was an evangelist. He was a missionary. He was one that God had used as, as setting the foundation of the church for the, the rest of the house to be built upon, writer of all sorts of books uh, in the New Testament, one who was just skilled and capable in all things, and yet he doesn't start out to throw around his apostolic weight, but instead he just says, I'm here, Timothy's with me, and we're just servants of Christ. He's noting that he belongs to another and that his actions, his behavior, the, the steps that he takes is ultimately dependent on the master and subservient to him. And implied in this is that he's willingly devoted to this service. This call for ministry is one that he espouses to the church with great joy and comfort and strength because he sees the tremendous opportunity that he has to come alongside of his brothers and sisters in philippi and to tell them of the gospel of the grace of god as he writes he writes then to the saints this word has been i think abused <laughs> Abused in this sense that we think of people who are superhumans. They're great ones. They're these ones that are just above everyone else. That, that they've been talked about in some respects as having done amazing works. About having been able to perform miracles and just have this tremendous life devoted to service in the church. We might even step it back some by saying that uh, so-and-so is a saint. They're just an amazing person who has shown great patience and kindness and just given of themselves and pfft, they're a saint. The idea here in scripture is used of anyone who belongs to Christ. These are individuals that God has set apart in his church, that he has taken from sin unto himself, that he has connected them to himself through Jesus Christ, and consequently anyone who has their eternal hope and security uh, lying in their Lord Jesus, they're saints. Just a couple of examples or illustrations. For example, Paul, when he starts out his epistle to the church at Corinth, identifies them as the holy ones. 
What's amazing about that is that as you read through the book of Corinthians, these holy ones didn't live in such a holy manner. (laughs) They had issues of sexual immorality. They were abusing the Lord's Supper, even getting drunk over consuming the wine. They were very proud and arrogant. They were abusing spiritual gifts in the life of the church. And they were not giving themselves over to obedience to God's word, even exercising discipline within the church. They were proud and arrogant. And and just chapter upon chapter, Paul is noting all sorts of amazing things that are present in this church. And yet he starts out and says, yeah, you're the holy ones of God set apart unto him. So it helps us to see that this isn't about special orders or special people, but simply those who are connected to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to how the Apostle Paul notes just this work of God's grace in the lives of his people. For example, in Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 6, a passage that that uh, we had attempted to commit to memory in Sunday school recently. Paul writes, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ. That's sainthood. God's mercy through Christ, extended by means of his love, overcoming our sin and making us alive and raising us up then to be with Christ forevermore. And therefore the Apostle Paul notes, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ in me and the life I now live. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's sainthood. And notice then the security that we have because these servants remind us of our position in Christ. Grace and peace. The blessings of God given in Christ. Grace. The absence of struggle. Because our relationship with God has been restored. That's peace. Notice how these common connections should then evoke joy. If God has loved us in Christ and extended unto us grace and peace, it means then that in relation to our sin and our weakness, God's grace is overcome so that we have been brought from death to life. If God has restored the relationship that we have with him through his beloved son, so that by this we now have peace, there is no longer then this turmoil. There's no concern as it pertains to the trouble of our hearts or the fears that are present or even as our conscience would remind us that we've grievously sinned against all the commandments of God and have never kept any of them. Yet of mere grace, God grants and imputes to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ. That's peace. It assures us that in this connection that we all have through Christ, and even in these troubled times, God's grace does not go away. His peace is no longer taken from us. He sustains us no matter the circumstance or situation, and we then are assured of that which is to come. Our common connection, our common bond, allows us to rest in the knowledge that God has provided this for each one who are truly hoping and resting in the Lord Jesus. And therefore, we can be assured and encourage one another with the promise that as you are a holy one set apart in Christ, God's grace and peace has been given to you.
by strengthening one another with this truth. What a greater hope, what greater hope or comfort can we have, even in times like these? And where else would you rather rest? Where else would you rather go? Where else would you rather stand than in this promise of this common connection? But Paul notes that in this, there's also a joyful connection. He notes in this in verses 3 through 8. And in this joyful connection, he begins to think about uh, the church at Philippi. After all, that's who he's writing to. And he, he's talking then about his prayer. And as he talks about this prayer, he talks about the giving of thanks. He's ultimately speaking about joy here. As he notes at the end of verse 3, I make requests for you all with joy. And yet notice how he walks through this. First, he, he talks simply about what he remembers about them. Just a little background in terms of the city of Philippi. It was uh, basically uh, conquered by the father of Alexander the Great, Philip of Macedon, in roughly 360 BC. He utilized it in order to secure gold for, to uh, fund his army and to fund his uh, empire. Eventually, it became a Roman colony uh, under the hand of Caesar Augustus in, in roughly the 40 to 50 uh, uh, BC. It was an important city. It was used as by means of military and politics and education. Uh, those in, who were Roman soldiers when they were off duty or finished their term as soldiers like to settle in this place. Because through it, they would not have to pay taxes, and they had all sorts of privileges. And this city was set upon the heart of the Apostle Paul, because in Acts chapter 16, as he uh, engaged in his second missionary journey, he had wanted to go into Asia and into Turkey to retrace his steps after his first journey. But the Lord prohibited him, and in turn gave him a vision to go to Macedonia. So the Lord, or Paul, in obedience, pursued it. And as he then steps foot into the city in Philippi, we learn of, of three individuals that, that he connects with in the first days of being there. The first was Lydia, a seller of purple, who was a Jewish proselytite. She was there meeting by the river on the Sabbath day because there was no synagogue present in the city. And so it tells us there were, uh, the, that this city lacked even 10 Jewish families. And yet as Paul was there and began to engage her with the message of salvation through Jesus Christ, God opened her heart and in turn a church started in her home. Shortly after, there was interaction by Paul with a servant girl who was demon-possessed that the masters would utilize and manipulate for, for wealth and money as she would tell the fortunes of others. And as Paul uh, engaged her, uh, he in turn cast the demon out and it created quite an uproar in the city. So much so that he was taken by his robe, as it were, hauled off to the civil magistrates. He was convicted of what he had done he was beaten and thrown into prison and there Paul and Silas are then singing songs of praise well into the night and an earthquake occurs and the Philippian jailer is fear, fearful for his life and for his well-being after all he had the responsibility of overseeing the prison and yet Paul assures him that it's going to be okay and the jailer is struck by the singing of Paul, by the patience and even the joy of Paul expressed through dire circumstances that he then cries out and says, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus. And the jailer does so that night and he and his household are baptized. Paul, in writing this letter, is writing some 10 to 12 years after the first events there 
in Philippi on his second missionary journey. And yet as he thinks back to what the Lord had done in their lives, he thinks also to the connection they've had through his ministry, that they have been present, that they have been supporting him, that they have been helping him, that they have been praying for him. He's only touched more and more, and their connection is building more and more through the church's generosity and kindness to him, and in turn, through the way in which Paul sees the hand of God at work in their life. Their generosity is such that that Paul commends them as an example to the church at Corinth. In in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he notes that even in spite of their poverty and great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Paul's touched. Paul's amazed. Paul is struck by just what God is doing in these people's lives. And consequently, he's saying there is a real joy that is present here because of our connection in Christ as you express this. God brought the recollection of the blessing and the joy that is present. And as God is the source of this, so God in turn is speaking to the heart of Paul. Paul, consequently, is just amazed and thankful for the fellowship that they have in joy. Notice what this tells us right away. We are longing for fellowship right now, aren't we? I mean, we're distant, we're apart, and we're going, I can't wait to get back. For what? When you have opportunity to come back and when this place is full again and we're interacting with one another and we're social distancing, rubbing shoulders. (laughs) What's that going to look like? Is it because we'll be able to have a few more minutes to sip a little more coffee and eat a couple more cookies and have conversation regarding just what's happening in each other's life? Is it a matter of just simply catching up as to how did you survive COVID-2019? Because that's not what Paul is noting in terms of his remembrance and his fellowship and his connection with the church at Philippi. And it surely isn't then, then the connection that Philippi had with him. Notice verse 5, your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. It's their participation in something that is shared. And what is shared is the ongoing work of God through his church and the advancement of his kingdom. It's the knowledge of of our connection to one another because of, as Paul notes in 1 Corinthians 1, the fellowship that we have in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's really speaking to the matter of our being a spiritual family who has received the saving faith of God. And consequently, we commonly confess that. And that's what gives us our joyful connection. the assurance of the work of God's justifying grace through his son as purposed by the father in love and as applied to us by his spirit. You see, our connection, our communion, our joy in one another is the fact that that we are in this together for the advancement of King Jesus. And consequently, we desire more and more to encourage one another to give ourselves to the gospel and the world. 
It doesn't mean that everyone's going to be on the front lines, but it does mean that everyone will enthusiastically support how the gospel is going forth in each other's lives, extending forth into each other's reaches, and consequently how the church is doing that collectively for the cause of Christ. And as we have this together, we then note that what also joyfully connects us is the opportunity to pray. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. Yes, because you have this fellowship in the gospel, but I bring this to the throne of grace. One of the ways in which we can continue our communion, even though we're apart, is by means of, of simply praying. Bringing our cares, our concerns, bringing our thanksgiving for others before the throne of God. Remember, Paul was in chains, jailed for Christ, and under possible death. And yet he doesn't start his letter talking about, oh, I'm hurting, and oh, it's so bad, and you wouldn't understand, and you wouldn't believe what they're doing to me, and you wouldn't believe how hard it was to get food, or how uncomfortable the bed was, or how much of a nag, or how much of a, a difficulty the soldier I'm chained to is here, or my cellmate, or, or whatever else. If only I could get outside a little more. If only I could do more. He says, no. I think about you. I long for you. I love you. And I pray for you. And I do so with great joy. One author noted that Ultimately, Paul's ability to express thanks to God for the Philippians is rooted in the understanding that, that God is the one who causes all things to work together. And so even through the common means of people as we receive common graces, it's ultimately the extension of God's hand in our lives. For as James writes, every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from, a bother, from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Every blessing, no matter how great or small, every blessing, even in the midst of inconvenience and sorrow, is still a gift of God's grace. And so Matthew Henry then points out that as holy joy is the heart and soul of thankful praise, so thankful praise is the lip and language of holy joy. The connection that we have when, with one another because of the Lord Jesus Christ allows us then to note it joyfully as we utter before God our thanksgiving unto him for the work that he's doing in others and as we cry out to him for that or in that, we then have opportunity to continue to hear and see what he's doing. And so it, in turn, evokes joy. And yet notice that this isn't then just simply left to a sense of, well, it's great that these things are happening right now. Notice where he leads this. The confidence that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The assurance that is promised to us here is that there is something that is certain. And what is certain is that as God has worked and is working, he will continue to work in the lives of his saints through others. To bring them to the point where they will one day stand in glory to the praise and glory of his grace. God will be successful in this work. It's absolutely certain to happen. As God initiates salvation in the lives of his people, as God is faithful to continue that work, so he also will bring it then to completion. God carries out his plan. 
Paul notes in terms of his prayer that as he prays this, it is with a, 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 a great hope. It is with something in mind. It's not just simply the uttering of words or the going through a list with no sense of, of surety as to what he's doing or what he's praying. But rather it's with the security that God effectively works. Do you see how that ought to then bring us great joy in our connection? Because it means that God's not only at work in your life, but he's at work in your life as well. It means that as God is at work in your life, he's at work in others' lives too. It speaks ultimately to the sense of of security that we have, that God is accomplishing all things in accordance with his purposes. And if God is doing that, even as we are experiencing all sorts of turmoil and hardships... then even though we're hurting and suffering, God hasn't forgotten us. God is carrying his plans forward. He's doing his work. This is true in relation to your soul. It's true in relation to the entirety of the world. He will complete it. And as this is our hope, as this is certain, We can encourage one another in these truths. What a comforting thought it is to be able to bring that along to another person so that even as they are stuck at home, even as they are unable to go out, even as they have seen their their schedules turned upside down, to have a believer come along and say, I love you, I'm connected to you, I love you. And praying for you, and I want to remind you, God hasn't forgotten you, and he's caring for you, and he's bringing you through. What a tremendous piece of news to hear. God is carrying this out in accordance with his plan. Well, we still have the point before us in terms of strengthening connections, but we could keep going on and on with that. And that would that wouldn't do service to the text, nor would it do service to to us as we're sitting here and so forth. So how do we wrap this up? Oftentimes we hear points about happiness. Happiness being what you make it. Happiness being those things that that you find delight, that you find comfort, that you find strength in. And no one else may be able to understand that, but because it's for you, then it's there and no big deal. But that's not what Paul notes. Paul notes something that is far different. Paul notes something that is far lasting. For if you're the determiner of your happiness, or if your happiness or security is ultimately up to what you make of it, well, what happens when you don't want to make something out of it? What happens when it just becomes so overwhelming or so discouraging so that you no longer want to clap along or you no longer want to feel or you no longer want to be under the experience of what's before you? Joy is far different. Joy is rooted outside of ourselves. In the knowledge that God has loved us through Christ. And because of his love, he is purposefully carrying us on to the very end. To work out his will for his glory. And consequently, as God unfolds that, no matter the immediacy of the moment or the impact that it has on us. Knowing that God is present. Knowing that God is at work knowing that God is effectively carrying things forward, provides the tremendous strength 
and even joy that we need. It's joy in Christ that lasts forever. May you ultimately be able to know of this. May this be the beginning of the things that you see taking root in you, even as you have things that may unfold in in the days and weeks ahead. May you be reminded that God is present and that as he sustains you, he fills you with joy because he has granted you as his holy one, his grace and peace and carries you forward at all times in that. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we ask that you would cause us to recognize this true joy that we have through Christ. May we recognize it not only in us, but in others. And may we begin to build one another up in these things, knowing that that's where our commonality lies. That's where our connection lies. That's where our encouragement may be had. So that we, in turn, might praise you and might see your church built up. Help us to have this sense of interest, this sense of desire, this sense of purpose. And may it unfold in our lives, not just for someday future when we come back together, but even now as we rightfully come alongside of one another to encourage, uplift, and speak forward the joy that we have in Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Joy can ultimately be found through Christ because God has promised that he will hold us fast. We have this hymn that is set before us here. Let's go ahead and sing the the verses reminding ourselves of the work that God will do where he sustains our joy even in the midst of discomfort.
we have joined together this day for our live stream service, we've been encouraged about the greatest source of the Christian's joy being in Christ, how Christ has lived, suffered, and died, satisfying the justice of God and washing away the guilt and stain of our sin, and even now is uh, ascended in heaven and seated on high, interceding for our be, uh, on our behalf. And this ultimately gives us our great joy. And to that end, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> 